These videos are offered on a pay-what-you-like basis. You can pay for the use of the videos at my website. There is a link to my website in the info box. The address is www.freelance-teacher.com slash videos dot htm or you can just use the link in the info box. By the way, I also offer tutoring via Skype and you can find more information about that Skype tutoring service at my website. Thanks. The, the theme now in the course is you guys are leaving classical physics and you're moving into modern physics. You guys have been going over some topics in modern physics. So what's the difference between classical physics and modern physics? Well, basically, uh, classical physics generally accords with kind of your common sense view of how the world works. Classical physics is kind of the common sense view of how the world works. Uh, and that's what you've been studying up to now. Now, of course, it doesn't always seem like common sense. But the idea is, once you kind of studied classical physics and got comfortable with it, it should seem like common sense. If you really understand uh, classical physics, most of the stuff in classical physics should seem like common sense. Um, and that was kind of physics that was de developed up to around 1900. And now, in the, in the end of the course, you're going over topics in modern physics that were pretty much got, um, developed after 1900. And the weird thing about modern physics um, is that it definitely contradicts common sense. Uh, it doesn't matter how carefully you study it. The better you understand modern physics, the more you see that it doesn't match common sense. Like I was saying, if you really understand classical physics, you should be able to fit it into a common sense view of the world. Um, but if modern physics seems like common sense, then you're probably not quite understanding it. All right, so we kind of have to shift um, our gestalt here. And one thing you should be trying to do is see, well, how, why is this weird? Why is this different from what we would uh, expect? Um, so what are some of the weird things in uh, modern physics? Uh, one of the weird things is relativity, um, which says that different people measure, um, different people can measure different lengths and different times, but I don't think your course is covering that. I think your course skipped relativity, so we don't have to worry about that. So the weird things that you guys are going to cover are the quantum physics. So what are the weird things uh, in uh, quantum physics? Um, so the weird things in quantum physics are, uh, let's see here. So first of all, wave-particle duality wave-particle duality, and what does that mean? Well, in everyday common sense, we think that some things are waves and some things are particles. Uh, but wave-particle duality says that everything actually has both wave and particle characteristics. So for example, um, kind of maybe a common sense view of light is to think of light as a wave, light waves. And maybe a common sense view of electrons is to think of electrons as particles. All right. Um, but actually, it turns out that you have to think of light as having both wave and particle. Actually, there was this huge, long historical argument about whether light was a wave or a particle. Well, you can see why they could never settle the argument, because it really has both wave and particle characteristics. What do we call a particle of light when we're thinking of light as a particle? Do you know what the name is for a particle of light? Photon? Yeah, that's a photon. I think photon is a Greek or Latin for, uh, photo is Greek or Latin for light. So photon would be a particle of light. So when we're thinking of light as a particle, um, we think of it as made up of photons. However, in other contexts, we have to think of it as a wave. Okay. Um, and the same deal, uh, uh, up to this point in your chemistry and physics courses, you've always thought of electrons as particles. You thought of them as maybe tiny little spheres, like tiny little billiard balls or whatever. But it turns out that electrons also have wave characteristics. And in fact, everything that we think of as a particle has wave characteristics. Uh, and that should certainly strike you as weird. This is not supposed to seem like common sense. For example, it seems like this chalk holder is a particle, basically. However, it turns out that it also has wave characteristics. Now, the wave characteristics of the chalk holder are so small that they almost never matter for anything. But the wave characteristics of the electron very often do matter. Um, but in any case, we're seeing that all particles also have wave characteristics, uh, however weird uh, that might seem. So we'll see what effect that has when we're solving problems. 
Why is it that we don't usually notice that the particles have wave characteristics? Well, it turns out that the wave characteristics tend to be important, um, generally speaking, only for things that are very small. Uh, very, very small, like atomic or subatomic. Uh, again, the chalk holder is way bigger than an atom, so its wave characteristics are almost negligible. On the other hand, an electron is very, very small, so its wave characteristics can be important. So the reason that we don't usually notice all of these weird things in modern physics is that they happen only uh, for things that are very small. Or relativity, which you're not going to cover, but relativity only is important for things that are moving very fast. Um, so this, the physicists like to say, well, if we just exist, if we were just much, much smaller, uh, then maybe uh, modern physics would seem like common sense because we would be used to things acting like both particles and waves. Okay. Uh, by the way, how, how can you describe when the wave characteristics of something are important and when the particle characteristics are important? Well, we know that a wave is characterized by a wavelength, right? Do you remember what the symbol is for wavelength? Yeah. Right, and what's the SI standard unit for wavelength? Uh, meter. Good. Well, it turns out that the wave characteristics of an atom are important when it has a big wavelength. characteristics that are important. The wave characteristics are less important. characteristics and not the wave characteristics that are so important. Okay. Now we're not quite going to de uh, describe right now why this is. We're just going to memorize that a big wavelength means the wave characteristics are important and a small wavelength means they're less important. As we go on we might see some reasons why this is important. But it's not too hard to remember. Um, just as a memory aid, the word wavelength has the word wave in it. So it kind of seems like common sense that if you have a big wavelength you have important wave characteristics, just as a memory aid. Uh, or as another memory aid, suppose your wavelength was zero. Well, if your wavelength is zero, you really wouldn't be a wave at all, and then your wave characteristics wouldn't be important. Now, nothing really does have a wavelength of zero, but when we're getting close to that, um, the wave characteristics are not very important. All right, uh, so it turns out that, um, that uh, again, in ordinary life, we're dealing with things with uh, relatively small wavelengths. This has such a small wavelength, you, can't, you don't notice the wave characteristics. But the electron has a relatively big wavelength. When we say big and small, we, those are relative terms. Well, the electron's wavelength is big relative to the other parts of the atom, say. Um, whereas the chalk holder's wavelength is small relative to the other things it's interacting with, like my hand or the chalkboard. So big and small are relative terms. <coughs> Okay, so that's our uh, wave-particle duality idea, and that's one of the big themes of uh, this chapter. And the other thing we should also stretch out, uh, stress right now is quantization. So we have to see the difference between quantization and continuousness. Something that's quantized can only take on discrete values. And something that's continuous, so the possible values for something that's quantized are separate discrete values, whereas the possible values for a variable that's continuous can vary over a continuum. It's easiest to understand this with an example. So let's think about what's the possible number, say, of children that a family can have? The possible number of children. What's the smallest number of children that a family could have? One. That's right. So smallest number of children that you could have is zero. What's the next smallest number you could have? One. Good. Then two. Then three. However, except as a joke, you would never say that a family has 1.7 children or 1.6 children. So the possible values here are separate and discrete from each other. You can't just fill in the gaps between these. These are separate and discrete values. So the number of children is quantized. 
Things that are quantized don't have to be quantized as integers. Uh, but the point is, as long as there's gaps between the values that you can't fill in, the thing is quantized. On the other hand, let's think about how much sleep I'm going to get tonight. Uh, well, what are the possible values? Maybe between 0 or, if I'm really overdoing it, 12 hours. Maybe the amount of sleep I'm going to get is between 0 and 12 hours. But it seems like, theoretically, I could, uh, the amount of sleep I, could, I would uh, get could take on any value in here, and I could stretch out the decimal points as much as I like. Uh, I could sleep for 8 hours, or 8.1 hours, or 8.1234678 hours. It seems like the amount of sleep I get is a continuous variable. It can take on anything in this continuum here. 